So as Ben said, the talk's gonna be on X-ray total scattering, but actually I am beamline scientist at the Super XAS beamline at um, SLS. So actually first I have to slightly advertise the beamline to a different community as normal. Um, so the Super XAS is a beamline for operando X-ray absorption spectroscopy, where we do a lot of various different methods of absorption spectroscopy, either through and the transmission geometry, which gives us very high time resolution in millisecond re region, or to a very sensitive detection for dilute samples and even things like pump probe spectroscopy for um, ultra fast processes. Um, so, a lot of the techniques I actually deal with is, is X ray absorption spectroscopy, where we can measure very fast the changing structure of material through the electronic and geometric state around a particular element. So XAS provides us this element specificity, giving us two regions. Um, one, if I can show the pointer. Um, so one region is the Zanes, which is the near edge region, and the other is the extended region after the edge. Now the near edge region provides a lot of information on electronic state of an element during an operando measurement, whereas the XAFS region, uh, we can Fourier transform and get an information on the local coordination geometry of the material. So the one limitation of XAS, uh, which is why total scattering comes in, is that XAS is fundamentally restricted to being a local pr geometry probe. We have this one over R squared dependence on, on the signal. So we get a very big dampening, which restricts only to around four to five angstroms in being able to uh, probe around a particular element, uh, local geometry. So to investigate a little bit further into materials, I use a method quite regularly called X-ray total scattering. Most people will be familiar with X-ray diffraction, where, for instance, you can use uh, a 2D image plate at a long distance from a sample to collect a very high resolution diffraction pattern and then refine uh, using refill refinement methods the long range order, so the Bragg diffraction and as such the crystal lattice of the material. X-ray total scattering is a very similar technique really. Um, what we do is instead of having a, a detector at a long distance, we put it really close. The reason for this is so we can collect a very high Q range of uh, scattering. Uh, I'll come into why we need a high Q range later, but essentially it gives us a very similar kind of uh, data set to deal with this diffraction. You still collect a 2D image and then you um, integrate that image and create a scattering pattern. Um, and Actually, this diffraction pattern you can refine using refill refinement methods and still do uh, analysis on changing lattice parameters, for instance, of a material. Uh, however, it's not as high resolution, obviously, as high resolution diffraction methods, and you don't have the separation of Bragg peaks. They often come very close together and overlap a little bit. But one of the things we're really interested in is how to get to the atomic structure fraction, which is the density factor, which is the equation below. We actually require for this method uh, a sample to detect a distance that's rather close, and we often use very high energies such as 86 keV in this, this example. Now here I show you also what it is when you take the diffraction pattern and you actually fit it using refill refinement, because it is still refinable. But the question is, how do we get to the atomic density function? So the atomic density function is um, a continuous distribution of the sum of atom pairs within a material. This is distinctly different from Bragg diffraction in the sense that it's not limited only to the scattering arising from a repeating crystalline structure. So we measure I of Q, so how do we get to the density function? So I of Q is the, uh, here is defined as the uh, coherent scattering signal from a material. Now, Scattering that we actually measure is a sum of coherent, incoherent, multiple scattering, and a background signal. So some of these factors we can take care of very easily. So measurement of an empty beamline and an empty sample environment are often used to uh, correct for background contributions that don't arise from the sample signal. 
multiple scattering is largely due to scattering within a sample and also can arise from double scattering involved both the sample and the container. As such, multiple scattering term must be minimized in terms of any measurement, but this is usually quite simple to overcome. So we need to go from the I of Q through to the S of Q, so the normalized um, factor function. And the S of Q is essentially defined by the, the Bragg equation, well, the Dubai, um, Dubai equation, which is the S of Q. So for an isotropic material such as uh, liquids, powders, the scattering factor can be uh, further simplified such that it leads to the only the limitation of elastic scattering, which is then yielding the Dubai equation. So up until this point, we have elastic and coherent contribution. Um, however, in total scattering, the method um, includes the intensity of beam, uh, includes the contributions of inelastic and sample multiple scattering. Another factor that has to be considered um, is that the atoms are not in a stationary position during measurement period. Approximation of the motion of atoms, as well as from the zero point quantum vibrations, the effect of the structure function is uh, the effect on the structure function is the decrease in the intensity of the Bragg peaks whilst the sharpness is maintained. This loss intensity is spread over Q in entire range and is often termed a diffuse scattering. Dubai Waller factor has uh, uh, Q dependence, decreasing in intensity across the bag peaks, and uh, a high Q significant, leading to a high Q significantly more to low Q. Thus, signal at high Q is most, uh, almost entirely formed of diffuse scattering. In powder measurements, the form is a continuous background to the Bragg peaks and is often discarded through diffraction methods when using a fitting background function in refill refinement. An alternative method here is actually just to take the Fourier transform of the normalized scattering function. And this leads to the G of R, the pair distribution function. And when we look at this equation, we can see something which is fairly inherent to this technique. We need a very high Q range. So here I have um, simulated the effect of the Q max of the integration, well, the Fourier transformation, for a simulated FCC lattice. It becomes pretty evident that we need um, measurements in excess of 20 angstrom inverse are required to get an accurate PDF. Below this, artifacts in the PDF appear due to the Fourier transform trun truncation. Obviously, high Q, the better that's possible. However, in time resolved measurements, often we are limited to due to statistics at high Q. So, where does this leave me and where my studies sit? A lot of the work that I do is on XFs. So, XFs is an element specific local coordination probe and is very sensitive in terms of what goes around in this, in, around an atom or a particular element type of the material, which makes it quite a powerful probe. Another tool that I use quite regularly is XRD. And through Riefeld refinement, you get long range scattering from the lattice, so the repeating crystalline unit cell. And PDF sits right in the middle here. So PDF gives you information on the local and medium range ordering and disordering in a material. So PDF, unlike XFs, is not limited to a local coordination probe. There is no significant dampening of R within a material. The only dampening on R is due to the lack of atom pairs that exist if you have a nanomaterial, nanocrystalline material, for instance. So now that some of the brief background is covered, I will show you two examples in this study. So I use both XAS and X-ray diffraction and also X-ray total scattering in understanding how seria-based materials have very unusual redox chemistry. Um, so I will show you two examples, one of a pure seria material and one looking for hydrides in a seria uh, gold composite. So seria is actually a very simple, cheap material, uh, especially in oxide form. It's often uh, found in, in rare earth metals uh, when, when you refine for more rare rare earth metals, Siri is often a byproduct in this production. 
but it has very meaningful use in catalysis in, in various different areas. One particular example is uh, where Siri is one of the most widely used in three-way catalysts, uh, particular for um, conversion of uh, auto exhaust gases. And with tightening regulation comes more and more research in this area. Another application where Siri has found to be useful is in soot combustion or in steam reforming with supported nanoparticles or actually more recently in solid oxide, solid, solid oxide fuel cell applications. So where does this bring to my study? Well, one of the things which is still under some debate is what is the interaction between steria and hydrogen? Uh, and how does this form complex structures which uh, can lead to significant catalytic benefit in, for instance, hydrogenation, hydrofluorination reactions? So this is where XAS comes in. So here I show you an example spectrum of a high resolution Zane spectrum of Syria. Now it has a very distinctive structure formed of multiple peaks. So this is an example where we have a purely cerium 4 plus material suggesting a fully stoichiometric CO2 structure. So the experiment that I was conducting was to heat this sample in hydrogen and see how the structure changes. When you heat in hydrogen, there's a significant formation of a shoulder on the lower side of the, the, the edge. This shoulder has previously been prescribed to serum 3 plus uh, present in the structure and typically is interpreted as the formation of defect structures. So the loss of oxygen from the structure forming CeO2 minus X. Now it is possible to quantify the amount of serum 3 plus and this is widely done to understand a little bit about what is the oxygen storage capacity in these kind of materials. However, after cooling the sample whilst maintaining a hydrogen flow, unusual redox chemistry does occur. In this case, we see an almost full reoxidation of, of Syria. So does this actually mean that we haven't lost oxygen from the structure? Instead, have we localized hydrogen forming a surface oxyhydride? or a, a serum hydride-like structure. So whilst XAS provides clues on what's going on on the electronic state, it doesn't really tell you very much on the atomic structure. In this case, I employed X-ray total scattering, where we had a sample to detect a distance of 18 centimeters and an instant energy of about 86 kV. And we performed the same experiment where we were heat and cool in hydrogen. Now you can perform the Riedfeld analysis and obtain what happens on the lattice parameter, and we get this kind of behavior. So the blue line demonstrates the lattice parameter, and the black here is actually an instantaneous expansion coefficient. So you can take the derivative uh, of, of the um, lattice parameter and derive the instantaneous expansion coefficient. So if Syria were to expand thermally, uh, it has an expansion coefficient of 9.1 times 10 to minus 6 per Kelvin. But what we see here is we have two regions of interest, one where we have a, a, a low temperature, where there is a dip in the expansion, and at the high temperature above 600 Kelvin, where there is an, ex, uh, an inflection to higher expansion. Actually, in the end, we were able to correlate the loss of surface carbonates and other bound species to this um, slight relaxation of the lattice at low temperature. But at high temperature, we were able to um, correlate this with what we observed in the XS and the fact that we formed serum 3 plus ions. A serum 3 plus ion is slightly bigger than the serum 4 plus, and therefore you lead to the expansion of the lattice. So XAS and XRD point towards unusual behavior above 600 Kelvin. In this case, it's where we prescribe the fact that you include hydrogen into lattice and you have an oxyhydride-like structure. So it's still an oxide, but it's incorporating hydrogen most likely onto the surface and subsurface layers uh, into octahedral holes within the, the, or in localizing on oxygen defects within the structure. So can PDF help us understand a bit more of this phenomenon by providing the local structure information? What goes on in local and medium range in a sense? So we took our diffraction and we applied uh, the corrections and did the Fourier transform to get the 
uh, distribution function. Here is the example below. In this case, actually, what I'm going to show is a very simplistic analysis method through just peak fitting to follow how different peaks move, uh, so expand and contract over different temperature regions. This is actually quite a simple thing to do, and you can just fit an asymmetric least squares refinement for the background, and then you can fit um, pseudo-void profiles and do a very, very quick analysis of a huge data set. In this case, it was one spectrum per two seconds. So we have, a, um, throughout the experiment, several thousand spectrum, uh, patterns to fit. So what do we get? If we look at one of the further distances within the, the serial fluoride structure, so serum, serum scattering at 6.6 .6 angstrom, and we overlay this with our XRD refinement, we find that in the medium range and long range, the structure agrees in, in how it expands. There is no significant deviation between the two methods. However, when we start to look at the 3.81 angstrom distance, what we find is upon cooling, um, there is a, a deviation between the XRD refinement and the position of this peak. So this is pointing towards a local distortion within the, the serial lattice. In fact, this can be enhanced further when you look at the serum oxygen distance um, at 2.34 angstrom, where we expect to see a bigger distortion if there is hydrogen uh, bonding within, within the structure. Uh, in this case, what we see actually is upon cooling, which is highlighted in the blue region, we see a very large distortion suggesting the inclusion of hydrogen within a structure. Now, importantly, what we do notice is that when you heat the sample, you expand, and when you cool the sample, upon cooling below around 100 Kelvin, 100 degrees Celsius even, we have a very rapid um, collapse in the lattice back to how it began, suggesting that whatever is going on is a reversible process. So typically, when you expose serial based materials to hydrogen and heat, people interpret the results as extraction of oxygen from the lattice. However, if oxygen is removed from the lattice, you would expect to, expect to see a permanently expanded structure. So in this study, what we identified is that under certain conditions, you can form a metastable state, which is the inclusion of hydrogen into structure. And now, this might be one of the reasons why serial based materials have recently been found to be very active in semi-hydrogenation catalysis and also hydro hydrochlorination reactions. So speaking of hydrochlorination reactions, I have a second example here, which is um, of gold, um, a very complex gold structure. So this was a serial coated alumina supported material, and we were looking at how this material interacts with hydrogen. So this was the rough kind of uh, structured material. We have an alumina support, and then we have a supported gold nanoparticle. And on top of that, we are coating that gold nanoparticle with a thin layer of ceria. So gold ceria materials have actually recently been found to be very active in hydrochlorination reactions of, uh, for instance, ethylene. Now, this is quite interesting industrially because it provides a very nice way of producing very high grade uh, vinyl chlorides. But the reason for this reactivity is little understood to date. So when we do a total scattering experiment, we now have a very complex high distribution function, or in fact, just the IFQ, which contains scattering com from the background from the quartz capillary, the alumina support, which is 85% of this material, roughly, 15% weight of ceria and a very small amount of gold. But can we extract some information on the gold in this very complex material? The answer is yes. So one of the things we can do is not the simple pair distribution function, we can actually do a differential pair, pair distribution function. Where first, in this case, I was subtracting the alumina support, which is fairly inert in this reaction and doesn't undergo any significant change apart from thermal expansion. So at each different temperature point, we ran a blank experiment, which was just an alumina support, and one which was our real sample. And then we subtract the relevant alumina support from the material, 
do the Fourier transform, and we arrive at the Paget fusion function on the right. So this actually contains two different structures. You have the scattering from uh, the serial and the scattering from the gold component. But the gold component here is still very weak, although discernible. In particular, we see the gold gold scattering quite clearly at um, the first and third major points in the lattice. So 2.76 angstrom and uh, just under 5 angstrom. So from the PDF, we can see quite clearly there is evidence for an FCC metallic structure and in addition, a serial phase. The alumina phase is not represented here because we have removed it from the IFQ. So what does this give us? Well, we can look at the individual phases present in this material, and this time I'm going to focus mainly on the, the gold. So we can follow the lattice parameter or the unit cell volume, and we can also follow the atomic displacement parameter, so the mu ISO. This gives you some measure of the disorder or thermal disorder within a material. Now, in a monoelemental system, the expansion of with temperature of, of the uh, structure can be described quite accurately by using Grunison theory. Essentially, we have a couple of equations to consider. One is on the left, the VFT, so the, the volume, and this contains terms which are constants and, and fairly well known, such as the volume at the set, our starting temperature, uh, and the K0 and Q0 parameters. One of the parameters we need to model is actually the internal energy. So the internal energy of this system is temperature dependent and can be modeled using the Bi equation. And when you apply all these, uh, fit the data to this model, you can actually extract the Dubai temperature for the material. So in this case, we extract the Dubai temperature of 170 Kelvin, which is very well in agreement with literature values for gold. But using the Dubai equation, you can also extract the atomic displacement parameter in a sense. So the uh, U-dynamic using the equation shown. Now, the UISO, which we actually measure, is actually a, um, a combination of multiple parameters. So the dynamic parameter, which is temperature dependent, a static disorder term, and also instrumental broadening. Um, in this case, we apply a correction so that the static and instrumental broadening are constant and assumed not to be temperature dependent, because our detector is not changing temperature. Um, so when we apply this model using our refined Dubai temperature, we actually find above 500 Kelvin in this case, there is a disagreement between the model and the measured disorder. In fact, we find a slightly smaller measured disorder in this material suggesting ordering at a high temperature. But what might be causing this? So um, when we look at the cooling data from this sample, we actually understand a little bit more about this term and suggest that, in fact, we have something else present in the material. So here I have fitted the data again, the uh, unit cell volume and the atomic displacement parameter to using Grunison theory and the Dubai model. And we find that on cooling, before 350 Kelvin, we have uh, a Dubai temperature of 173 Kelvin. This is slightly higher than as previously discerned. Now, Hydrides such as palladium and palladium hydride often have a slightly higher Dubai temperature than their metallic counterpart. And when we use this Dubai temperature of 173 Kelvin to look at the atomic displacement parameter, what we find is that um, the model fits rather well to the disorder. So from these X-ray total scattering um, studies, we, we can suggest the presence of potentially a uh, gold hydride species. Gold hydrides are notoriously difficult to really uh, characterize, and there's been multiple studies trying to find evidence for them in the past. But as I said, gold cereal materials in the past and recently have found to be very active in, in hydrochlorination reactions. So is it the ability of um, cereal and gold to form hydrides in the exact same temperature region vital in the catalysis that uh, we want to understand. 
Now, I'm slowly doing more experiments to understand these parameters, but I haven't quite got there yet. Um, so the brief summary of this talk would be that XAS is great, and you should come to the Swiss Light Source of, to RPMine, but also that when you want to understand the structure of material, you have to use multiple different techniques, particularly when you want to understand the operando uh, electronic geometric structure material. So XAS provides a, a method for looking at um, the electronic state and also the local geometry around a specific element type. Diffraction is very good at showing you the long range structure through the repeating unit cell and the Bragg diffraction. But X-ray total scattering provides a unique tool for really looking at what happens on the local and medium range in a very complex material. And it's, in a sense, a very, very complementary method towards doing materials characterization studies. 